Welcome to Living Legacy Leadership, where we explore, discover, and share insights, tools, and strategies for a life well-lived into elderhood. I'm your host, Donna Kim Brand, author, speaker, legacy strategy coach, and creator of the concept Living Legacy, where you choose to live life on your own terms while contributing to people, places, and projects along your life journey. I believe that the life you live is the legacy you leave. Now, the guests I bring to you each week all address some unique aspect of learning, leadership, or legacy. This helps you raise your own game as a leader in business and life and also showcases some extraordinary people who exemplify living legacy leadership. At least once a month, I also offer a training session to skill you in game-changer thinking for your own application. So get your notebook ready or sharpen up your memory by tuning in your attention and we'll dive right in. Now today, that um, very graphic invitation to sharpen your memory um, is particularly apropos because we have Glenn Merchant with us today of throwaxville.com. So welcome, Glenn. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Now, I understand you, you just came down off the mountain from the woods where you were camping because you got rained out in a storm. So where are you now? I'm back home in Asheville. Uh, we were camping about 45 minutes out, so it wasn't too bad of a trip home. Well, that's good. So, of course, Asheville is the famous Asheville, North Carolina. And um, before we get into the the incredible details of what you're up to nowadays, you spent most of your early professional life as a, you know, com- self-confessed computer geek. Um, yeah. By, so how did you make the transition to what you're doing now? And then tell us what you're doing. Um, after about 20 years, I just found that I was no, no longer as passionate about computers as I had been. Uh, decided it was time for a switch and uh, didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. So I just started poking around, seeing what was new out there, what was fun and what would fit in with the cool Asheville vibe and uh, discovered axe throwing. Axe throwing. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah, that is a pretty much a, a new, I'll call it a craze, um, highly popular. Um, and did you have any history of throwing items, sharp items, um, <laughs> anything uh, like that? Not really, not really except in anger. Uh, this was <laughs> just something that once I read about it, figured uh, – it didn't sound like it was something that I couldn't handle. You know, if you have the strength to pick it up, it's, you know, throwing it. And then we just sort of help get a distance from the target and eventually we'll get you to hit it and stick it. Mm -hmm. Now the reality is, um, I've seen your website, which is throw axville, a X E com. Did I get that right? Throw axville.com. Yeah. The the name is, uh, the original name was, was axville throwing club. And then uh, we've since sort of expanded that to a couple different between our mobile unit and our different uh, storefronts. So we just changed it to throw Axville to kind of get everything under one umbrella. Fantastic. And of course, tied in, at least at the moment, with Asheville. So Axville in Asheville. Um, But your website uh, depicts how beautifully you've set up the environment. So despite the fact that people might have kind of rustic images of throwing axes, describe to us the facility you set up and what actually goes on there. Well, most people, when you think of throwing axes, you tend to think of being around a campfire somewhere out in the woods. Uh, in your backyard. And while that certainly is true, uh, we wanted to have the added benefit of having a fun environment indoors as well. Uh, Amy Zimmerman, who is, uh, you know, the, our creative owner, she's the one who really uh, got the game plan together to dress it up and make it look really uh, attractive, male, female, you know, young, old, it's just a very appealing environment. Uh, so you can come in. There are little lounges to hang out in as well as a bar to get a drink from, uh, TVs to watch, and then there's some room outside as well. So it kind of allows those who want to throw to throw, those who don't have other options as well. 
That's really cool. Now, um, I'll just raise this because it, I'm sure, and looking over some of your press reports and the media coverage, people do raise their eyebrows when they hear a bar and having a drink and throwing axes. How do you how do you manage handle or manage that? And um, you know, where what's the what's the scope on that? Well, I think it's most people's first reaction when you hear doing something potentially dangerous, throwing a sharp object, and then adding consuming alcohol at the same time. Uh, and that's the natural go-to thought process. However, we usually combat that with asking people, have you ever been hiking? Did you have a beer while you did it? Have you ever been you know, out biking or rafting or canoeing and pick a sport that doesn't involve having a beer either just before, just after? And that's sort of the same theory as we don't entertain folks coming in and drinking for a couple of hours and then partaking, it's normally you come in at a set time, you have an hour or a two hour time frame, and then you get a drink, throw a little bit, and then you take off for the day. So it's closely watched, closely monitored. Uh, and we just make sure that everyone's able to at least just have some fun while they're throwing their axes. Yeah, fantastic. And of course, in North Carolina, I think the craft beer industry is really thriving as well. Do you serve craft beers there? Yeah, and that's frankly what originally you know made us think that the having a beer while throwing an axe would be uh, an acceptable activity. Uh, you can't do anything in Asheville without a beer involved. Uh, my local barbershop <laughs> has a tap beer where you can get up to eight or nine different flavors of beer getting your hair cut. Uh, you know, rock climbing, <laughs> biking tracks, anything you do here, somehow they sell beer. So it just sort of fit right in. Uh, again, with the caveat that they, as well as us, you just monitor. But most Ashevillians don't overdo it anyway. It's more of you're enjoying the beer itself. It's not a contest to see how much you can drink. It's enjoying that one or two beers you may have. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I was pretty shocked, you know, um, I think a common conception might also be that your main customers will be what I'll call rednecks. But who actually are m your main customer base? Um, it's a pretty broad mixture. We have uh, a lot of locals uh, who are from some of the outlying areas that may be a little more uh, blue uh, blue collar than maybe your incoming tourists or, or whatnot, but we've got plenty of locals who enjoy it. A lot of a heavy tourist base among those that tourist bases. We have a tremendous amount of bachelorette parties, birthday parties. We do a lot of corporate events, uh, especially from organizations with maybe uh, numerous chapters in the Southeast region and they'll converge on Asheville and one of their days will be spent with us and we'll, you know, help them, you know, find uh, some meeting space if needed or suggest restaurants or cater in and then have some acts going to make it a little more enjoyable. Mm. Now, uh, the two things on what you just said. You you said bachelorette, not bachelor. So do you, are you finding more women are finding this appealing and fun than men or it, more than you expected? Close, maybe? Yeah, absolutely more than expected. It's uh, probably about 55% female to 45 percent male uh, huh. and they're the most fun to work with because i think most most guys sort of expect it it's something they'll be able to do because it's somewhat sporty and athletic and a lot of the female don't believe they're going to be very good at it so we get that much more of an excitement out of showing them it's pretty easy and with a little bit of instruction and a couple tries that suddenly you're as good or better than the guys throwing because uh they tend to listen a little more carefully and follow instructions a little better. <laughs> you think? <laughs> Indeed. So, so share with us, so how does it work? So somebody makes an appointment, as you said, they come in. Um, what's the setup? And, you know, I've never done it. I'd actually like to. I'll pay you a visit and give it a go. Uh, what happens um, so that I don't make a total fool of myself or, or chop down the facility? And then give us a little bit of technique. It's it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, normally you'll make an appointment online. Uh, the booking is all done online, or you can call in or email. But just as easy to go ahead and uh, go to the website and book it straight from there. You show up to your appointment. We'll uh, especially now with the pandemic in effect. Uh, you know it's a lot more structured. But you'll come in. You'll show ID. We'll make sure that 
you're the right person, your group shows up, uh, you can get a drink. Then you'll, once your group is fully arrived, we'll send you over to your coach. The coach will work with you uh, for about the first 10 to 15 minutes, depending upon the group size, and they'll give you a rundown of safety things to, to consider, different features. They'll show you different throwing techniques, and then they'll sort of give you some personalized coaching, get your distance marked because the, the game is really about your distance from the target with the way that you happen to throw. Everyone's different. Everyone throws in a different intensity or different form. So the spacing is really what's key to making sure that you hit it at the right time. So the coaches will make sure that you get hitting it. Then they'll go to the next person, train them up, go to the next person. And then once everyone's kind of hitting it regularly, that coach will step back, let them play a little bit, then introduce some possible games and different uh, contests and formats that you can utilize and you know, just try to do whatever they can do to make sure that you have a good time. Mm, very cool. So I imagine that that some people will go in there and think that the way that's going to work is through brute strength and and others will do funny things with their arms. Even when I just imagine it, my elbow will stick out or maybe I, if I tuck in my elbow, then I don't have the power with my, my wrist. What is some technique that's effective and what, what doesn't work so well? Well, as we alluded to earlier, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of the fellows will come in thinking that power is the key, and you know, maybe they played football or baseball. They think if they can wing it really hard, that that's going to be a lot more impressive, and that's indeed why uh, our ladies tend to be a little more effective because they don't have preconceived notions. They just listen, follow instructions, and they're hitting it. Generally speaking, much quicker than the guys. Um, but you just we, we try not to change your throwing motion too much because if you've ever had a golf swing and you have someone come in and completely revamp it, you'll be worse than you were before you walked in. So we try <laughs> to coach people with their existing throwing habits and try to just tweak it rather than completely alter it. But we have all kinds. We have people that we always jokingly refer to it as a chicken wing where instead of uh, <laughs> lifting it straight over your head as if you want a hammer – the arm comes out to the side and they end up throwing it sort of cross body. And we've got a two hand that prevents that a little bit and helps guide it and make it a straight up and down throw instead of coming from one side of your body to the other. Uh, but it's everyone throws the same basic one hander for the most part to start with. And then we'll move up to the two hander or the underhand or different options on throwing. Hmm. Hmm. And um, I, I think I saw in one of the articles, there was a reference to what, what was called the thwack of connection. You know, there's something to do with a thudding versus clanging uh, when, when your ax sticks in the target. Um, tell us about that and what your target is like. Well, we generally explain to people that even, again, male, female, young, old, when you first get in there, it's a little overwhelming and intimidating to be throwing something, ax, hatchet, anything of that nature. And you just feel everyone's watching me. I don't know what I'm doing and I'm going to embarrass myself. And we try to tell people the first few throws, assume you're going to miss. It's going to make a noise. And the noise is quite awful when you hit it you know, sideways or on the head or on the handle. But then you'll know immediately uh, going back to golf, of course, you can duff the ball up and down the course all day. But you, you finally hit that one beautiful stroke and it feels right, looks right, flies right. And this is the, the same theory that – You'll just feel the ax come out of your hand, and it just feels exactly right. You'll see it spin, and when it hits, it has the most marvelous thunking noise that instead of a clang, it's this soft thud that hits in, and that's everybody's first time. They spin around eyes wide. <laughs> uh, so we, we try to coach up for that to that first thud to get people that excited, and once you hear a couple of thuds on some continual throws, that's what gets people really getting into it and then from there they can try throwing a little bit harder if they want or try a different style but it's that initial thud that really kind of sets the moment for your first axe throwing very cool i can imagine eventually it becomes addictive once you've sort of got it down and then you you, you talked about changing distance to the target and changing different styles